All right, well, let's turn it over to Scott now that he's back. Right, uh, it. Well, I mean, who knows? It could go either way. I could disappear any moment. <laughs> All right, good luck. All right, yeah, thanks. Hey, <laughs> how's it going? Believe. Uh, I'm Scott Hanselman, and uh, I just tweeted that you should lower your expectations because I was trying to think about what I would show during this uh, talk as we you know, kind of begin to wind down our first day as we've got so much great content for the next couple of days for you. And I was talking with Scott Hunter and Damian Edwards and some of our friends on the ASP.net team, and someone had the scandalous idea that I should perhaps update my personal websites to .NET 5 live, which is a phenomenally bad idea. Just a nightmare. Why would you do such a thing? Uh, currently, uh, my personal website, Hanselman.com, is uh, running uh, .NET Core 3.18. And then if I visit, uh, actually, that was Hansel Minutes, pardon me, my podcast. And then uh, Hanselman.com is running 3.1.10. These are what are called LTS releases, long-term support. And if you go over to dot, .NET, the .NET website, and you hit download, you can see that you've got .NET 5, it's out. It's fantastic. It's our recommended version. It's the one we're excited about. But if you're a little more conservative, you might want to click on LTS. And what does LTS mean? That is long-term support, right? So that's an extended support period. If you're planning on staying on a version of .NET for a long time, you know, years, uh, the next version of .NET, .NET 6, will be an LTS release. And we're going to alternate current and LTS. So we know that I'm currently running an LTS version. But I was thinking, you know, how hard would it be? Is it a big deal? Could I potentially break something? And even worse, what if I were so stupid to actually try it on two different websites in production why not, right? Like, what could go wrong? It's not like anyone visits these websites. Cool. So there's my personal website, and then there's handsomeness.com. Now, I want to point out that on my podcast, not only do we have the version of .NET uh, Core that we're running, we also have this lovely thing that Damian Edwards helped me put together, which was the build. So I can actually click on that and go and see the build on my CI CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment system, as well as the git commit for that particular thing. So this is a nice little touch. Of course, it's a small website, small personal website, but what a joy to be able to see the actual commit and uh, build so that I can go and click on those, right? And, uh, and get there. You might wanna do this on your site, uh, maybe when you're logged in as administrator, perhaps. Now, if you go to my website and click on those, you're going to find that you can't see anything because those are uh, private uh, sites. So my private GitHub and my private DevOps are showing you when those things happen. And we deployed, uh, it looks like in September, uh, looks like I made a small... There we go. I made a small text change in September. So I can go and see what's in production. And it's real nice to be able to see what's in production. Now, first, let's talk about how we do that, and then let's do something stupid and potentially upgrade this whole thing to .NET 5. Cool. So doing that, let's go and we'll search. We'll Google with Bing. And uh, pro tip for you, always type in Hanselman before all of your, uh, all of your searches, and you'll get the right answer. Uh, I did a blog post here in March called adding a git commit hash in Azure DevOps uh, with an ASP.NET website. So a couple of things going on. We've got this, this footer here. Okay, In that footer, we've got one very simple line, which is looking at system.runtime and pulling out basically the, the, the framework description, the text of the framework. So that's a way for .NET uh, 3 point whatever or 5 point whatever to go and say, hey, this is the version. Now, I should probably cache that. The smart thing to do, given that this is a div, is to probably put a cache tag helper, tag helper here and here and hold it forever. I'm going to be paying a, a small cost by digging deep into the law of Demeter and bouncing, bouncing, bouncing. But not a, not a huge deal. Not to worry about it. Okay. Now, this is a clever thing that uh, that Damian Edwards showed me here. We've got this assembly informational version as an assembly attribute, little attribute. And what he did is he took that and he added a plus and then put the git hash at the end of it. So you've got your version of your, uh, your application. And I think mine is perpetually uh, at uh, version one and then a git hash. And the way that you're doing that is by adding source revision ID when you go and do a .NET build. So here we say .NET build 
be passed in source revision ID, that git hash in most CI CD systems is in fact an environment variable. So getting that is not a huge deal. So then if I'm using something like Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions, I can pull that out. So when I go and build my application with .NET build in my CI CD, you can see me saying, hey, what's my source revision ID? And I just pull it out of thin air. And it doesn't have to be Git if you're using a different system. That's totally cool. It's just basically whatever source uh, version that you want your uh, revision ID to reference. That basically then stamps it into a assembly on your, uh, uh, excuse me, an attribute on your assemblies. And then we've got this little git hash helper function that basically says, all right, we either have a hash that's a local build or we have a real one. We just go and double check for it. And I say, hey, you know, it'll be whatever is on the right-hand side of the, of the plus there. And we'll pull that git hash out. It'll either be local build or it'll be whatever we have stamped on that, on that assembly. Pretty cool. Then in the razor page, in the bottom of the razor page there, I've just got this, this commit hash where we say app info git hash. App info is just a static data structure. We store a bunch of crap in there. Uh, the, the git hash then allows us to build a path, which we could then use to visit uh, our application's source location, which in this case is my GitHub. All right. Then, uh, this is other ways I could have done it. I didn't want to do it. Blah, blah, blah. Then this was a little bit of a hack, and I feel kind of weird about this, but uh, we, we've gone back and forth. For more details on the build info, just make a little JSON file. JSON files that are created in a .NET application automatically come along for the ride. They don't need to be marked as content. They automatically get copied into your, your bin debug, your bin release. So inside there, we can put our build number, and we just make this little helper. A little helper function. It's got both git hash and short git hash, caches them. And then we can go and we can say in this git hash via build, and then I've got my DevOps or my Azure, excuse me, my GitHub um, actions right there, build my URL. And then, of course, as I mentioned, wrap the whole thing in a caching tag so that I don't have to do anything. The result of that is I get to always be confident which source showed up there. I think we've all been at that point where it's like, I think I deployed, I think I know what's going on, but let's just really go see what's in staging and what's in production. Okay, so I see that I'm on 318, same thing going on on Hansman.com. Uh, this is my Azure DevOps. You could be using, of course, GitHub Actions. Um, and let's do this. Let's start by going into our main application. This is the Hansman.com web page, website. I could right click on this and hit properties. And I could also, of course, open up the CS proj and go and look in there. Oops, go and look in there as well. And we can see over here our target framework. So I'm going to switch that target framework. Switch that to .NET 5. Okay. And I'm going to hit save. Now the other thing I could potentially do just because I like to see what's happening underneath is I'm going to right click in here and I'm gonna go and look at what's really happening in my project file. And we can see the target framework right there that switched to .NET 5.0, which is cool. All right. Now, every move to a different uh, version of something uh, can involve breaking changes. They're all written up. It just depends on what you're doing. There might be breaking changes around how Windows and Linux work together, how um, resources and things like that work. It might be that a, an API changed, but you might have no issue at all and things just line up. It really depends on the complexity of your application and that's why we do these kinds of tests. So let's go and do a build. Do, 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 do. Oops, where am I doing? I'll just hotkey it, control shift B. Oops, I'd have, I'm sorry, look at that. I didn't reload my project. That was sloppy of me. There we go. I can do it from there, Control-Shift-B inside of Visual Studio. Or I can come out here and I could say .NET build at the command line. It really just depends on what makes me happy. Come out here into PowerShell and do it. Looks like the build succeeded there. Do it here as well, just to prove the point. Cool. So that looks like it runs. Let's do .NET run locally. Cool. Looks like that's on localhost 5000. We get that little protocol error because we really want to be doing this on 
Okay, so here's my here's my Hanselman.com on a local website, powered by .NET 5. So that worked. All right, cool. So it works locally. Cool. So now I'm going to go back here, stop this. I could then say git diff. The only thing that I changed in this case was the target framework from Net Core App to Net 5.0. I could do the same thing by going over here, and there's a new git daily. Uh, do 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 do. View history. Yeah, see. I can go in here and then let's try to compare this Git compare from inside of Visual Studio with the new Git stuff, which is lovely. If I click the right thing. And it looks like, yep, same thing. Net Core App 5.0. I actually have my diff tool set to Visual Studio Code, which is kind of ironic, but uh, you get the idea. Okay, cool. So now, if I push this up to GitHub, it will start building. But will it just work? Will it just work? Well, there's a couple of things to think about. It won't just work because first, the pipeline isn't set up for .NET 5. I need to have the SDK, the .NET 5 SDK, running in Azure DevOps or running in GitHub Actions. That's thing number one, because remember, it's going to leave my machine and go up there. It needs to be able to build up there. I'm not actually building here and, and sending it up there. And then the next thing I need to think about is is the Azure website that I'm about to go to ready for it? So let's talk about those two different things. In Azure over here, we'll go and put in Hanselman, and I'll go look at my app service. Okay, and then I'm going to click on uh, configuration for this particular application, which is an app service plan running on Linux. When we click on configuration and under general settings. In the short term, I went over here and I said .NET Core, and I was like, oh, no .NET Core 5, what? And I was like, this is bad. And I realized that it's called .NET 5 now. So it's under .NET. They're gonna merge these. So .NET Core and .NET are really just, it's .NET. It's confusing to have two in the future that'll be like that. So I can go and .NET 5 is available up there in the cloud right now. So that's cool. So I'm ready to go in the cloud, but I could also do a self-contained build. Now, it really depends on how you want to split up your responsibility. Having App Service and Azure or your cloud be responsible for the version of .NET means that it'll automatically get updated, and that's nice because it'll have that runtime uh, installed locally. Having a self-contained build puts you in charge of doing your patching and stuff like that, so you're going to want to watch out for that. So let's look at our pipeline here, and I'm going to go ahead and click and say Edit. Again, there's a couple different kinds of pipelines, so I'm going to show you two different ones. This is the old style pipeline where you're using a visual uh, builder in order to uh, edit YAML. And then there's the new YAML based one. And then of course there's GitHub Actions. But the general idea of what I'm trying to accomplish here works everywhere. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take this task, I'm gonna change it from 3.1x to 5.0.x. Now I would have said dot star, but dot x means a floating version number, okay? So we're going to change that, and that is going to change the way that our application builds. Now I'm going to hit save. I'm going to say updating to .NET 5. Now I'm not going to say save and queue because I haven't yet pushed into the cloud. I don't want this pipeline to run yet. Okay. Now we're going to go back over here, and I'm going to say git add and git commit updating to .NET 5. Uh, please work. Okay. Git push. If you want your prompt to look like that, I'm using Windows um, Terminal with the lovely pretty prompt from our friends at Oh My Posh. So if you go search for Hanselman pretty prompt, you'll be able to find that stuff. Uh, now we can go over here and see this pipeline start running. Look at that, updating.NET 5. Let's click on it, click on it, click on it and look at our agent. So I'm doing the free stuff. So we'll see if this agent uh, spins up because I got I don't want to pay for anything, right? This is all using the free uh, abilities that we have in Azure DevOps. Of course, you could use the free stuff in GitHub Actions as well. It's getting the .NET task here, right? That's the task called use.NET. That's the task that I passed my version number into. It's going to go and get that. It's going to go and get the .NET Core CLI. Cool. The, the task for the CLI, rather. 
And once it does that, look, here's my .NET Core SDK. Oh, here we go. It's going to check out my code first. Okay, cool. Checking out my code. Blah, blah, blah. Do, do, do. Pass in time. Okay. Now, once I got this right, it's going to go and find ah, .NET 5, not in the cache. Detecting OS platform, and now it's downloading the version of .NET 5 that it needs. Okay, and then I added this one here. I added .NET version just so I could actually see it call .NET dash dash version. So the by putting it 5.0.x, I'm causing my CI CD tool to go and and build this stuff. Is my cam gone, my friends? Am I still on the line? Let's find out. Everyone is questioning that they can't see me. Well, they can. I'm here. All right. So, boop, boop, boop. Okay, getting .NET 5. Digging it, waiting for things to build. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Okay. Now it's going and it's running. Yeah, it's extracting the .NET Core SDK. There you go, boom, there, but da, 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 da. here is it, is that it? Running .NET, I just ran .NET version. That way I can click on it and see, look, it found the SDK version five. Now it's doing a restore. Okay, now at the end of this, here's the build that we're gonna do, building with the .NET 5 SDK. Again, we didn't have it, so it was brought down onto this. The same thing would occur on GitHub. Actions, boom, it's built. Now a publish, we'll go and do a publish. Now this publish is interesting, right? Because we're doing a self-contained publish and we're gonna go and actually do it for Linux, right there, Linux x64, because that's the one I'm using in, in um, that's the one I'm using in Azure. I wanna save a little money on that one. So I'm using the uh, Azure App Service Premium V2 to run all of my websites on that one app service. A lot of people have a tendency to think that they need to have an app service per app. It's not true. You can, in fact, have uh, just one app service plan and put a ton of stuff in there if it makes you happy. Now it's going to take that zip file, okay? It's basically zipped up my thing. And now, now, here we go. It's built. It's built, but it's not released. Now, I do my releases automatic because if you're going to do a release, you do it in production. Uh, the right thing to do would be a manual triggered release where I would basically get an email that the build is ready. I would check it maybe on staging, but I'm an idiot. So in fact, I'm going to do that uh, live and it's going to download that zip file, which is the, the, the file system that represents what things should look like into production. Now we're going to go back over here to handsome.com. I'm going to point out that we are currently powered by .NET Core 3.1.10. Deployment in progress. It's going to go and run that, and it's doing the Azure App Service deploy, and it's sending over to, to Linux. Now, if I go to Linux and I click on the Deployment Center, now I'm back over in Azure now. You can actually see here a deployment command is running via a push deployment. Okay, that's happening right now. Okay, and it's thinking about it. Website's still up and chilling, doing its thing. Okay, we'll go and see it. Looks like it succeeded. Come back over here and hit refresh. We went from now. We're right now. We're on .NET Core 3.1.10, and we've got success right there. Let's cross our fingers and see if our website is still up. Oh, because you fools are hitting it. Want to do this at two in the morning on a Sunday? Is what you got to do, kids. Maybe don't do that. Maybe don't beat on my website. What I should do is I should have a staging. .hanselman.com, and then I should have the thing uh, go and work uh, on staging, and then I'll do what's called a VIP swap. But uh, ordinarily, no one's visiting my website, so you all may have broken me, which would be ever so embarrassing. Here we go. So here's the app service on Linux starting up. Please stop beating on my website, people. So mean. Don't know how many people are watching right now. Please stop hitting my website. Doodle, doodle, doodle. No, okay, I'm not sure if I need now. I did a self-contain, so I should not actually have to do that. But I could theoretically switch that if I wanted to. But I think what's happening is I'm trying to do a live, live update. 
Why do I tell you all to stop? Log is up. It's hit by you all. Let's go look at the log stream as a team. I just realized that my monitor is over here, but I'm looking over there, but I'm looking over here. So it looks like I'm looking away from my code, which is not cool. OK. Uh, stopping site, initiating warm up, listening, starting container, just like ready to serve requests, listening on root path. Mm, why are you so mean? Oh, well, that's why you're all hitting the website. I thought I would be doing it when you were doing this. All right, let's see what's going on here. We can click on the metrics and go and zoom in on what's going on there. And let's actually see if we have a app insights. Do we have an application insights? I don't know if I ever hooked up app insights on the main website. I don't think I did. Go back over here. 231 users. Now that's the that's the podcast. That's a different website. This one's over here. I'm going to do this. Oh, here we go. Warm up request. Stopping site because it is not healthy. Ooh, this is good. Someone attacking me? What are you doing? Range not satisfiable. Oh, this is great stuff. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop that. Yeah, Jeff, why don't you jump in while we debug this and ask me some questions from the Twitter? Hey there, and, Scott. Uh, good to see you. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm interested in how people are being rude and hitting on my uh, my live website. Uh, what I what I did not anticipate was that I was going to make a staging site and then do what's called a GitHub dip swap, basically bring up a version of my site and swap it, which mm. would have no downtime. And I again, this is production work, right? But I didn't anticipate this being an issue while people were, like I say, hitting on the uh, hitting on the website. What oh, kind of they're they're after you, Scott. They are after me. I mean, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. Absolutely. Do you mind if I bring up the tag board so we can look at the question? I would love nothing more, sir. Fantastic. It's like we've done this before. Absolutely. There we go. So there's a there's a bunch here that are asking kind of the meta questions. How's Scott Hanselman doing that? For example, Mark Davis asks, hey, what tool are the presenters using for the Zoom, the Red Box, and the Arrow Awesomeness? Uh, right now, I am using Zoomit one word from sys internals and i'm pressing if you want to switch back to my screen i am pressing control one here we go and we'll bring me up pressing control one once i do that it freezes the screen and zooms in i can then draw or i can hold control and shift drag away to point an arrow or i can hit control and alt to draw a square and then once you kind of get your, your head around that, you can go and do stuff like this very comfortably. And it becomes quite nice. And then you can do things like green, blue, or yellow. Yeah, once you... The only difference between control uh, one and control four, control four is actually live, taking a screenshot and allowing me to move. And there's some issues there. You can see the double mouse situation right there. But uh, for the most part, it works very nicely. There we go. Once okay. you get used to those tools, you're going to be juggling, moving through here like Steve Karnacki pointing at the map. You know it, brother. You know it. And I don't actually have a touch screen, but I could do a lot with this. Yeah. Okay. What else you got? Yeah, let me head back over to my screen. And we'll click away from this one. Um, hey, what tool did you use to blur the subscription IDs in the Azure portal during the live demo? Asks Jacob Bundgard. So I am currently blurring live my Azure subscription IDs and my, my email address and different stuff like that. And that is with a tool called Azure Mask that Brian Clark has. It's not in the Chrome store, but you can find it on Brian Clark's uh, GitHub account. 
and then you basically have to enable developer extensions uh, and then load it unpacked. And then I got a little help from um, uh, from Shane Boyer, who allowed me to uh, add my own uh, GUID for my subscription ID and actually went and um, fixed that as well. He's uh, He's got a few updates. It's no longer called Azure Mask. I've seen it called AZ Mask. And you'll find it for the various browsers. Is it in, is, did he actually get it in the thing? And I was looking at old code then. Yeah, yeah, I believe he's got it updated now out there. So then it, it runs in all the browsers, runs on all the operating systems, Windows, Mac, okay. and Linux. Really cool stuff. Let's see if we have another question here we can go to. Uh, let's see here. The main thing is just change the version of your app to .NET 5, but what about upgrades to your NuGet packages? And Great point. The IoT Maestro. So it actually all depends on the NuGet packages, right? So in this case, my dependencies are so simple because this is a pretty straightforward application. The only external package that I have here is this NWebSec ASP.NET Core middleware, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is a, um, a web security middleware. On my other website, which I can also upgrade easily, I've got a couple of more packages. But for the yeah, most yeah. part, these will just work. These are like the health checks and things like that. There aren't any major changes that I have seen to break these particular things. It really all depends. The thing that I like to use is Dependabot. So if you go over to my pod, uh, over to my podcast, which you can't see, and I click on pull requests, you see I've got actually already a pull request from Dependabot letting me know that there are versions that are 5.0 versions of these things including extensions like poly. So then I can take each one of those extensions one at a time, and you'll notice that it'll tell me where one of them broke the build and when one did not break the build. And I've got testing on this one here, right? So if I go down here to lazy cache and I find out why did that build break and what is going on there, I could go and dig into the details of that. Here's the run that went bad. You see that I've got a reference the package directly issue, right? So I had a little version number downgrade, but for the most part, Dependabot will go and run builds on each one of your things and let you know what's going on. Um, so I would just basically go through these one at a time and update them and it would probably not. And there's websites back up because y'all chilled out for a second. It's, it's amazing what happens when we finally get them to chill out here. Well, I want to point out that there's a couple of things that I could have done there. Like I was taking a chance and I miss, I misunderestimated uh, the enthusiasm of the audience. But what, what I'm doing here and what I could have done is I could use like Azure front door. I can drain traffic off of one website and switch it to the second one, bring that one up slowly, mm -hmm. confirm it on five, and then slowly drain traffic one to the other. That's a thing I could do. I could do that same thing with... Uh, staging slots in, in Azure Application Services. I only have one app service. I would have to have two. I'd bring one up on three, done at three, the other one up on five, then slowly drain traffic as I brought the other one up, then upgrade the second one, and then put them back together. I could do that. Um, if I was using Cloudflare or a third party, I could do a similar kind of thing where I put a put a block on mm -hmm. the thing, basically say app off, you know, application offline, if you're familiar with the way people used to do that in uh, IIS. Um, in this case here, we had a person who was kind of down, like, you know, don't beat a guy when he's down and he's down and he's like, yeah, I'm trying to get up. And people are like, beep, 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 beep. You're like, no, just let me, let me get steady state and it'll be okay. Once steady state was occurred, the site is now upgraded and that's cool in the gang. Um, now I could go and do it for other websites as well, but in the doing of that, I might end up, you know, breaking stuff. Like I might get in trouble and that might not be the smartest, smartest thing that I've ever done. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that for my main website, I don't actually have any tests. I have, um, I do have tests for my podcast, so I could do that. But it's kind of, it just all depends on the complexity of your thing. Like if I go in here to my podcast website, which is considerably more complicated, and go in to this, do, 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 do. oops, I keep doing that, and click .NET 5 and save it and then build it. It'll do the, the restores and whatnot. We'll see if it kind of just works, okay? 
And then while that's happening, I'm going to come out here and I'm going to type in Z cancel minutes. Z is the way I CD around. And I'll do a get status, and we can see that the CS proj was modified. And I can see a couple hands on its core cannot be referenced by another project, right? So that makes total sense, right? So the testing application is, in fact, not .NET 5, OK? So we're going to want to fix that, because I've got a more complicated thing. The testing app is a .NET 3 referencing a .NET 5 application. So I'm going to go and update that as well. OK, updated. Build, restoring packages. Well, that's, uh, well, that's building yeah. for you. We have a, a comment here I think we I want to share that I, I think you'll definitely appreciate here. Um, Jose Molina Melendez says, uh, watching Hanselman update his blog live on a demo. I see your test your production your code in production. I too like to live dangerously. I do, I do. I'm not a clever, not a clever man. Um, this is yeah. So here we go. So this is good, right? So here we just broke something. So here I'm doing testing, and it looks like my Selenium remote driver failed, right? So that that would be a thing I would need to go and update. And then there's there are global tools like .NET outdated. So if I go and search for Hanselman.NET outdated, there's a wonderful, wonderful global tool. I could go and make sure that that is installed, okay, so, already installed. And, and I think there's two interesting things that you, that you jumped through right there. You're sure that the test builds now. You have legit test failures happening. You've crossed over to that next what, step. What I know right now from just watching that failure I can do it again. I just go and say test dot um, ps one is it is trying to fire up Selenium, which is going to then allocate uh, a, a browser, and it could not get a hold of that. Now it could be because I boogered up my Chrome or something like that. It looks like it's unable to talk to Selenium. Now I have an alternate way to test because I have multiple ways to test. I could use Docker for my tests. And I've actually got a test system that runs in Docker headless. So now mm -hmm. I'm going to actually, oh, my Docker is not running. So I'll go and run Docker desktop. And I'm actually running Docker desktop with WSL. Like if I've got WSL here, I could split screen my terminal. Can we just appreciate for a minute how many shells you have configured there? Oh, you like that? I'd like to, I feel like this is the price is right here. Or, Right, uh, Wheel of Thank Fortune. You. I'd like to buy a shell. Oh, My goodness. I want to point out also, if you click the drop down and then hold down Alt while clicking, it will get a split screen. And I want to also call attention to, I put graphics in the corner so you can tell what shell that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And then I did this one for you. Oh, see, that's so nice. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, Docker just started up. I'm going to do the same build instead. We'll go ahead and close this and close that. And then I'm going to go over here and I'll hit Docker test. So rather than building in Windows and sending to Linux, I'm going to go and build in Linux without that, um, that Selenium issue, because I may have a Selenium, um, a Selenium library issue, or maybe, uh, or maybe I've messed up my version of Selenium. Well, that's restoring. Can I throw another question at you? You may certainly, sir. Here we go. Coming in, this is the Stonehead. Asks, Ooh. what's Scott's favorite Visual Studio shortcut? Control T, the only one that you need to know, which is the one that gets you where you want to go. So if you're sitting in your code and you hit Control T and you just start typing, it will go and pop up whatever you want. So if you're looking for a particular method inside of JavaScript or whatever, it's all there. Control T. Enter, and now you're where you want to be. That is my favorite shortcut. So this here is inside of Docker under WSL building. The, uh, oh, but this is going to fail. This is so cool. Uh, we're out of time, aren't we? I'm worried we're out of time. We're, we're a little bit long, yeah. OK, sorry. So look, why is it going to fail? Oh, look at that. Huh? 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 There's no way that's going to work. It's the, okay. the ripple down effect. Now you got to go touch your Docker. Oh, this is great. This is, this is the joy, right? So now 
right click, open terminal and file explorer. Bop a doop do. Probably popped up on another screen I can't even see right now. I don't even know where that popped up. So many things happening. Let's go ahead That's and amazing. open up open up another uh, another window here. What's happening? All right. Oh, there we go. It popped up over on monitor three. Okay. Look at that. Now, okay, there's our fail. Yep. So that didn't work. Awesome. Dig it, dig it, dig it. Now, I could do this, which is totally stupid because I'm not even going to read a blog post. I'm sure there's probably someone explaining how this works. This would probably be 5.0. Right? I think it is, yeah. And then this will be 5.0. Okay. Run it again. Very exciting. Very exciting. Go, go. We totally guessing. successful build. Right. Totally, totally guessing here. And we want to play the Windows okay. to the Yeah, so there you go. Manifest not found. So I got to go up to the doc, go up to the website now. Like 501 or something I missed. Mm. Or is it just five? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Well, Richard, who wrote the da the blog post, is always good about this, because right at the top he says container images. He always does this. So here are the container images, and the... Do, 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 do. Yeah, uh... Container, containers, containers. Where's the name? Oh, here we go. Five point oh, zero. Okay, so it's not it's not at slash core anymore. Okay, that's cool. That makes total sense. All right, good. So now, Notepad, Docker file. I don't know why I'm using Notepad. Notepad that goes is your away. Friend. Notepad is your friend. This is Notepad two. Which is one better than Notepad? I should be using VS Code. Did we need a sequel? I could also be reading documentation and actually concentrating and not being a silly person uh, and trying to do all of this uh, without practicing. Why is but this is the kind of stuff people are going to do, right? They want to know how hard it can go. So now it's .NET SDK. Cool. Got it. I, I love an ASCII progress bar. You know what I mean? It's the progress bar for me at this point. You know, people have 3D cards and NVIDIA 3080s, but I'm excited about a nice ASCII progress bar. That's that's what makes me smile. Okay. Now I know that this works though, because what I can actually do simultaneous to this is I'm gonna go over here while that's building inside of the container on the left, on the right hand side, just to prove that I know the website will probably build and I just need to spend some time working on my other stuff, is I'll just go and say .NET run for the podcast site itself, which we have upgraded already. We just haven't got our linkages working. There we go. So that's on 5001 HTTP localhost. 5001. Oops. HTTPS. Beep boop boop boop. Loading up the podcast site. All right. Okay. So there you go. So the site works. Yeah. Okay. I've... Local build. See? Told you. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So now that works. So I've proven that. I'll run. I mean, I'm sure there could be something subtle or weird, right? But, you know, you get the idea. Now, this is interesting because, of course, you know, this is a multi-stage Docker build file. And, of course, it's going to take a while the first time that it's mm -hmm. doing that. The very first time in this case, it's doing a .NET restore. So if we go and look at the task manager, we're going to see a bunch of downloads from NuGet and whatnot beaten on the, the network. Looks like it's bringing out. It's done already, right? So now we're going to go and copy that in. And that will run those tests. And I would propose that I'm going to learn, and I'll blog about this tonight. That's probably just as I need to update my Selenium stuff using, oh, by the way, using, I think I showed you that uh, .NET outdated, which is one of my favorite global tools. Have you played with that much? No, I haven't. See, uh -huh. right? It feels like that's the other side of Dependabot. They both do the yeah, same yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah, there's a thing. lot of great tools. .NET outdated is just one of them. I just I just kind of like the way it looks. There's three or four examples of what these look like, right? 
I also want to point out it's getting mad about analyzing my dependencies. That's because I have some local NuGet servers and some servers that, of course, go and do this up in um, at work, you know, internal NuGet, so it's not able to find all of those. Yeah. There you go. So now, look, it's running, it's running my unit days. tests. And look, there you go. It passed 19 of my unit tests except for the four that use Selenium. So now I've confirmed that my issue is going to be the Selenium driver, which was alpha anyway, when I started getting it. And then so I'll go and I'll yeah. test whether or not I want to upgrade these different things. But even if you're using .NET 5, you can still reference older uh, assemblies. And as we can see, for the most part, it works just fine. Yeah. Anyway, I could go on forever. I'm taking up your time. I was going to say, we need to get, get roll over. We're about to have our attendee party, our code party. Ooh. that I'm we're going to jump into here. I will put you on the iPad and take you to dinner. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm flattered. Can <laughs> Having a nice, having, what are we having for dinner? Surf and turf, chicken nuggets from, uh, or, or Chipotle? What's going on? I, I think it's Blue Apron tonight, which is our, our little meal kit that they sent us. There you go. All right, so that one is still on five. I'm going to update that one. No one's looking tonight. I'm not going to take another chance and update another live website. People are doing their thing, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that a successful presentation today. Yeah. It made it to five, you just gotta deploy. Yep, yep. And I wanna I do want to fix those tests because I see them working in Docker, but I want to make sure that uh, I want to I need to figure out why those selenium ones are not lined up. But uh yeah, it, it wasn't a huge deal. You saw that it was already ready in Azure App Service, and uh it was not a challenging upgrade at all. But of course, you could stay on LTS as well. So I'm just feeling pretty good about .NET generally. And, and I'll wrap up by saying, you you know that I stream a lot here on Twitch. Um, and the updates that I've done to my projects to .NET 5 have all been very smooth from 3.1. Yep, 100%. Um, so. Uh, right now, I'm going to with one final tip where I'm going to say WSL shutdown. That's going to reclaim my memory that was used up by WCL and Docker because I'm not going to be using them for a while. And I'm back to a normal amount of uh, memory. And I can uh, see that my WSL instances are shut down as well. Cool. Thank you for your time, sir. All righty. Thanks so much, Scott. We really appreciate you joining us. All right. All righty. We will catch you later. I'm going to bump you out. Take care.